Great. So, uh, uh, very good morning, everyone. Uh, and um, uh, welcome to uh, the. I think we are in the in the tenth uh, session of the of the semester, uh, dedicated to my energy. Uh, we will welcome today a fourth uh, uh, guest speaker uh, in the lecture series. Uh, her name is uh, Kara Daggett. She's associate professor at uh, Virginia Tech with focus on um, a political ecology and uh, a politics of energy. And with the with the uh, very exciting brief uh, around the birth birth of energy, the the history, uh, let's say, of use of energy in in a, uh, let's say modern modern world and the the kind of uh, uh, entanglements uh, that uh, uh, that we experience with the with the fossil energy. Nasli will introduce Kara. Uh, in a moment, uh, and uh, uh, before uh, before we we start uh, the terms, uh, a warm up uh, game uh, shared uh, uh, by Kara this morning. Uh, let's go to the first one. Uh, the first term is work. Uh, very simple uh, word. Uh, and surprisingly, we we never had it uh, as a term on the table in this lecture series. Uh, our second concept is waste. Uh, so uh, uh, let's have the slide with both uh, with both uh, notions and uh, five to six minutes. Um, I suggest to. The terms are very general, but please do think them in relation to energy, and uh, also why not, uh, let's say, in in relation to to your subjective experience, to your everyday life experience of these notions. Where uh, is energy put into work? <laughs> in what form <laughs> it coalesces into your own work, and. Um, where does waste occur or what what can be considered waste so uh, this is perhaps my my advice kara uh right now uh is um i think uh, um six or more hours behind us uh so therefore uh uh she prepared kindly a recorded lecture which we will play in a moment especially for us and she will then join us for the q a in a more acceptable <laughs> hour around let's say five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning uh, uh, at uh, virginia tech um as usual uh let's say the the uh, people um uh in the in the in the first uh, half of uh, let's say alphabetical list uh, can can work on the on the term of work and then the second half of the auditorium on waste we are this morning you can all see that i guess uh, around 58 people at this moment uh thank you for being here in the in the busy one of the busy final weeks of the semester <laughs> great to see you Stefan. good morning <laughs> calling in from france from the french countryside or so <laughs> i don't know where but great to see you <clears throat> indeed uh, a good point is of course uh, uh, once again to emphasize for phd students among you who you know, would like to um, have a different uh, uh, form of evaluation. Uh, our graded exercises are tailored for, let's say, undergrad students as a kind of a complement to their curriculum and their design work. I think for PhD students, it would be more meaningful to, to write 
uh, an essay to elaborate uh, a certain aspects of their research uh, with our team. So please approach us directly about that. How is your work powered at the moment? <laughs> and uh, how is your energy wasted? Perhaps we can surprise Kara afterwards with your uh, with your brilliant uh, vignettes, with your brilliant thoughts. Great. I uh, I can see that there's a lot of uh, work right now. There's a student with a hammer. I guess he's building a model. <laughs> it's not clear. <laughs> let's uh, let's go further. Okay. Uh, this is a, a kind of a hamster wheel, okay, so it's a kind of hard to see the purpose, I guess, okay, sorry about that, uh, waste, um, this is probably the, 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 the great Pacific garbage patch or something like that, yes, indeed, the waste accumulates uh, in a, in a, uh in the ocean um the waste is being exported indeed to uh the third world from europe uh long absent soon forgotten very true unfortunately something to be urgently stopped uh <laughs> work <laughs> um nice yeah work consumes a lot of uh, energy and electricity these days uh google what was the google query here do you can you read it nicely it's a little bit too small on my screen how to be energy yeah. efficient right yes yes okay <laughs> i'm not sure you google will tell us but we are trying to <laughs> figure it out <laughs> in this lecture series and in our semesters uh, work is zoom it's dangerously close to kind of uh, uh, turning into into a zoom activity you are very right thank you for that um, um, <laughs> work um, work uh, is ultimately extractive somehow and it is powered by fossil fuels this is true and maybe that is that is the message that you're you're um you're thinking about uh great um well, since we are, since we are in Zoom, it's okay. <laughs> of course, louder is needed. I agree. We were searching for them this morning. Let's go further, Nasli. Maybe, uh, um, uh, yes, also very nice. A lot of laptops, lot of loaders everywhere. Unbelievable. Um, all part of a kind of a planetary energy grids. Uh, this is nice. Um, um do you wanna uh since we are in zoom indeed luca do you wanna tell us uh what your thoughts mm -hmm. are in this case um are you there with us luca why don't you tell us what what were you thinking about here yeah um i thought about how um work can change um our energy mindset or um change the the way how we use energy and so i thought about um changing the minds then a change in a political way then that goes on for the infrastructure and then for the landscape interesting so uh so indeed so this is focusing more on a on a on a kind of i guess uh kind of education emancipation kind of uh uh um recognition of of you know of, of basically knowledge that we that we gain through work it's it's beautiful we should of course remember it <laughs> indeed thank you so much okay let's uh, look at a couple of more examples 
waste, building waste, it's very correct. This is on your mind. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like uh, production of, of, uh, of uh, biogas or, or something like that from banana peels. Uh huh. The packaging, yes, packaging uh, produces a huge amount of waste. I read uh, this morning that Europe is preparing a new set of regulations to reduce uh, the kind of escalating amounts of uh, of uh, packaging waste in on this continent. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another uh, kind of metabolism of waste uh, uh, or, or another kind of metabolism that produces waste. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Maybe we can uh, read uh, what, is, what is written here. Um, um, okay, so the, the different sort of... Uh, 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 um uh heat uh, emitting devices and and uh energy consumption on on ones on a on a desktop of an average student thank you very much for that so uh um it was a, it was a nice reflection we will uh, share this with kara and i hope to uh convey her impressions on this exercise in the last session next week. And uh, now, Nazli, if you would like to first introduce Kara before we start with the lecture. So, as Milica said, uh, Kara uh, sent us this recording because uh, it's very early there and uh, she's, uh, uh, she kindly accepted to join for the Q&A. And uh, it's a very... Uh, I think interesting finish to our guest lectures because it maybe uh, would make us think a bit more about kind of like the history of energy and uh, what it actually means. Uh, that's why uh, we are very uh, delighted to have her here uh, today, uh, even though remotely and with a pre-recorded video. So. Kara is a political theorist who teaches at the Virginia Tech, where she researches the politics of energy and the environment, feminist approaches to science and technology, and histories of empire. She holds a bachelor's degree in biochemical sciences from Harvard University, a master's degree of international relations from the London School of Economics and uh, Political Science, and a doctorate in uh, science from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, her research also uh, explores this politics of energy and environment in an era of planetary disruption. She is interested in questions that lie at the nexus of human well-being, science, technology, and the more than human world. Daggett's book, uh, which we also had as a reading, uh, the introduction uh, of this book, The Birth of Energy, Fossil Fuels, Thermodynamics and Politics of Work, traces the genealogy of energy and analyzes how energy science offered the means for 19th century imperial and industrial managers to quantify and track labor. So uh, her talk today, Kara uh, uh, will try to uh, trace the historical emergence of the relationship between energy and work, focusing upon how work came to be understood and valued as a site of energy transformation. And she claims uh, that a historical perspective of energy suggests that sh shifting our fuel cultures will require a corresponding shift in post-industrial cultures of work and Western understandings of freedom. Uh, so now going back to the lecture. Hi, I'm Kara Daggett, and I am sorry not to be joining you this morning um, or this afternoon for you, but I look forward to joining you in person live for questions at the end of this talk. So give me a moment to share my presentation with you. Okay. Today, my talk is called Desiring Energy, Toxic Fantasies of Fuel, Freedom, and Work. And 
the point of the talk is to disrupt how we think about energy and how it's desired. So I'll be talking about my research into energy as a Western logic and also as a logic that's fundamental to extractive practices. Let's start by asking a very broad question, what is energy? It's fuel to many of us in this room thinking about climate change. And that's probably what most people think that I'm talking about when I say I study the politics of energy, not gravity or how well I slept last night. Energy is simply the thing that we need to drive the economy, to get stuff done. It's something that we trade, that we extract, that we burn. And much of the work on energy policy has this technocratic basis. At the end of the day, energy is just assumed to be something that we can count, store, trade, make more efficient, make more green. But energy is also a capacious concept. It's a word of modern science, modern physics, meaning life force, flow, and change. It's a popular term in new age philosophies. Um, it's a popular term in ancient uh, or assumed to be uh, associated with ancient theologies and cosmologies. All these meanings mix up with each other in popular discourse. So in my research, I'm interested in this broader cultural behemoth called energy, especially how it's understood in the West when we're talking about fuel. What I'm arguing is that energy reveals how Westerners in particular see themselves as humans relating to the world that has more than human agents and things in it. To give away the answer from the beginning, Westerners believe that humans are those creatures who can and should put the world to work, both as a capacity, but also as um, a moral project. But I didn't know this. I didn't think about energy this way when I started researching my book. And this is the cover of my book called The Birth of Energy. All I knew at the beginning was that energy was a rich, complicated thing. And I wanted to know how it came to be narrowed to mean fuel in politics, to stand for the major environmental problem of our time. In other words, I wanted to do what Michel Foucault calls a genealogy, meaning I want to know when and how a certain common sense about energy came to be. Many of you might know a scholar named Donna Haraway, um, who has this great paragraph that became important for me. And in this paragraph, she talks about how she studies biological cells. Haraway says that biological cells are historical figurations. They are real material things. They're also metaphors inflected with language and social values. Um, from the connotations of the word cell in English and the feelings that that word carries as it relates to boundaries and exchange. So biological cells, uh, the question is not, is it real or not? Is it true or not? But rather that they are both material things that we live in and through and also metaphors rather than either or. That, um, approach to thinking about the material world and thinking about scientific knowledge is how I approached energy. So asking the simple question, how did energy become energy as moderns know it, very quickly disrupted some assumptions that are commonly made about energy and politics. First, although energy feels very old, like concepts such as matter or force, which do have ancient pedigrees, energy is a very new scientific concept. It only comes about um, in science in the 19th century with the new knowledge of thermodynamics. Prior to the 19th century, 
energy was a rarely used word and it mostly had poetic and philosophical connotations coming from Aristotle, who originally coined the term energeia. Humans were um, obviously using fuel and machines prior to the 19th century, but there wasn't an overarching um, knowledge system that connected all of these activities together. So you couldn't do something like compare the energy consumption of a car to a horse in the Pleistocene era, for example, which is a very common way of comparing civilizations now. Second, the laws of thermodynamics do talk about energy as this universal thing that doesn't change across all transformations. So it has this universal feeling to it. However, energy also appears to be a fossil fuel knowledge. It's only through tinkering with steam engines in the 19th century and wanting to figure out how the burning of coal moved pistons that scientists devised the notion of energy. So energy comes out of humans working with fossil fuel machines and their interest in making those machines more efficient and more profitable. Finally, it turns out that the more you dig into the science of energy, the more you realize it's not a settled concept, even or maybe especially within physics. Energy is not a material thing at all, unlike the biological cells that Haraway talks about. Rather, it's a mathematical relationship. And this math of energy is useful in many closed systems in figuring out movement and change. But theoretical physicists feel free to ignore it or change it in others. Lest you think this is just a humanities person who is getting the physics wrong, I wanted to share some great quotes from famous physicists about how weird energy is. And these are physicists who aren't used to thinking about um, science in the way that Donna Haraway does as, as imbued with metaphor and these other kinds of sentimental feelings. But here they are noticing that energy is actually more of a mysterious epistemology or way of understanding the world than it is itself a thing in the world. So first, this is uh, Richard Feynman who taught a famous series of lectures at Caltech in the middle of the 20th century. And he says, it's important to realize that in physics today, we have no knowledge of what energy is. We do not have a picture that energy comes in little blobs. It's not that way. However, there are some formulas. When we add it all together, it gives the same number. Second, and this is my favorite quotation from Percy Bridgman, a Nobel laureate physicist who says, the laws of thermodynamics have a different feel from most of the other laws of physics. There's something more palpably verbal about them. They smell more of their human origin. Why should we expect nature to be interested either positively or negatively in the purposes of human beings, particularly purposes of such unblushingly economic tinge? I only have time to briefly review what the laws of thermodynamics are here, but I want to do that just to stress their political effects and the way that they fed into this economic tinge that Bridgman is talking about. So let's go back to the birth of thermodynamics when energy is supposedly discovered. Turner painted this about the same time and place that energy was born in the 1840s UK. Steam engines had been running for decades already at this point, transforming ways of life, but they were very inefficient. No one knew quite how they worked because no one yet understood heat as molecules in motion. I like to think in Turner's paintings of a newly industrializing country, you can see the uncertainty and anxiety surrounding these changes to the landscape and to ways of life. You can see the uncertainty of understanding the way that, for example, railways 
um, are working and dramatically transforming the familiar. The first scientists of energy were motivated by a desire to make this hazy picture more ordered and sensible, to make steam engines more efficient, to rescue them from the haze and wreak as much work as possible out of every lump of coal. To do this, it turns out, you have to get better at tracking this unruly thing called energy. So when applied to governing an engine, it looks something like this. The first law of thermodynamics explains that the energy of inputs like fuel or bodies or machines equals the energy of the outputs, which could be the work done. The form of energy might change, but the underlying quantity stays the same. And anything that doesn't appear as work could be coded as waste, things like heat or friction. Unfortunately for humans, there was also a second law of thermodynamics because it was clear that although energy was conserved, in these heat transformations, something was happening in terms of um, the work that could be done at the end of the transformation. Unlike uh, changes that were reversible, like uh, rolling a ball into another ball, and then you could just turn around and, and reverse that uh, movement backwards. In the case of heat transformations, like steam engines or like our own living bodies, these are irreversible transformations. So once you burn that lump of coal, that's it. If there was a lot of waste that happened in the burning of that coal, it is, quote, lost to man irrecoverably, which is a quotation from Lord Kelvin, one of the first so-called scientists of energy. So in Northern Britain, um, we have a really burgeoning culture of shipbuilding, and we also have um, a very committed set of Scottish Presbyterians, including many of the first scientists of energy. And for them, these measurements about work and waste were overlain with moral and spiritual meaning from the start. And so scientists who were studying the way uh, steam engines worked in this diagram also thought about applying this knowledge of energy to other kinds of systems like cities and bodies and empires. This slide shows how you could apply energy to the governance of work, where work begins in this period to be understood as a site of energy transformation. All activity could be understood in terms of energy and tracked according to how efficiently it was used or how much was wasted. Human work gets valued then um, because this is a very uh, capitalist and imperialist culture Human work gets valued according to its proximity to production or productivism. And by production, I mean um, moving matter to create things that can be commodified and sold for a profit. Activities that were reproductive or caring or leisure might be supportive, although they also demanded efficiency. So you get things like home economics. And those activities that use energy with no benefit to production were to be tracked down and policed as waste, as um, negative. So energy feeds into this ideology that uh, historian Anson Rabenbach has called productivism, which arises in the middle of the 19th century industrial period right alongside the new science of energy. And productivism is, quote, the belief that human society and nature are linked by the primacy and identity of all productive activity, whether of laborers, machines, or natural forces. So through productivism, human labor seemed natural, a reflection of physical laws, and at the same time, the non-human world was treated as industrial, like this earth of metallic parts on the cover of The Economist. The world becomes, quote, a vast protean reservoir of labor power awaiting its conversion to work. And the same tools that you might use to make an engine more efficient, then you can also use to make a forest more efficient or a city 
or um, the sunlight falling on a desert and not being caught by solar panels, to use a more contemporary example. Energy is the thing that makes all of these activities comparable as work. So the argument of, of um, the second half of my book is that energy becomes a very attractive tool to serve a project of extraction and accumulation. It's especially useful in the new field of engineering, which is also born around this time in the 19th century, tightly connected to the science of energy and a field that is closely aligned to capitalist interests. Engineers become the mine managers and the factory experts. In engineering, energy is frequently referred to or described as the ability to do work. Power in engineering is then the rate of work done and work is something like moving matter. In energy politics, these physical definitions are often conflated with their political terms. So decades before thermodynamics, the first people to tinker with steam engines also conflated these things, as in this quotation from Matthew Bolton, who was Watts, James Watts' partner. He says, I sell here, sir, what all the world desires to have, power. So when we speak about energy, work, and power, these terms are still haunted both by thermodynamics, but also by this longer standing project of capitalist accumulation and production. This is a familiar story to many of us, um, but energy plays a foundation, foundational and often, I think, unexamined role in this story. The science of energy lends this ideology of work and production an aura of scientific authority. The universe seems to validate the European and later American project of putting the world to work. And it verifies the goodness of turning fuel into power wherever the fuel is found. The religious belief in thrift and self-discipline could also then be expressed as a scientific practice, as something that is in line with cosmic actions and truth. So there's a slippage that goes on here between the needs of capital and the laws of nature. And this is that economic tinge that Bridgman was referring to. Because if you just took the mathematical equations that describe energy conservation or entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, those mathematical equations don't tell us how to value energy. They don't tell us what counts as more or less useful energy, useful for whom and when on what time horizon. They don't tell us what waste is or the difference between good work and bad work, for example. And yet energy has helped to license the modern sense that there is a linear relationship between using energy and having progress. A linear relationship, in other words, that always means that more energy is always a good thing. Freedom from any limits imposed upon energy then um, sounds a lot like political freedom. Life with less energy appears as if it would be nasty, brutish, and short to use Thomas Hobbes phrase. And this message resonates because work is still understood in the 21st century Western cultures to be central to citizenship and to dignity. Even many on the left have learned to couch their demands in the language of work, which is built, still built upon a productivist orientation to the earth. So one through line of my book is that by following this connection between energy, work, and freedom, we can see how it remains dominant in how the West understands and imagines energy today. Let's look at some discussions that are happening right now around energy, um, for example, in the US this year. So one thing I wanna point out is um, the fossil fuel industry, which relies upon one story that's repeated over and over again in defense of fossil fuels and in praise of energy more broadly. And this is the story about jobs, that any kind of climate action is going to kill jobs. And you can see that in these tweets from American Petroleum Institute and also from Republican senators who are connected to the fossil fuel lobby. However, 
the um, President Biden, a Democratic president, also takes up this language around jobs and puts it at the very center of his own environmental policy. So as he said when he announced um, his climate plans last year, today is climate day at the White House, which means it's jobs day at the White House. Climate mitigation um, and legislation became part of a bill that was not the Climate Act or Green New Deal or anything having to do with environment. It was called the American Jobs Plan. So of course, this is a bit of political theater that counts on the appeal of jobs to get sweeping legislation passed in Congress. However, it's that very appeal, this connection in the public imagination between jobs energy and well-being that doesn't get questioned or held up for critique, that that's part of the ecological problem that I want to pose here. So why? I, I guess it's worth spending a little time pointing out why this promise of green jobs is on shaky ground. So there's at least three reasons I could point to, and, and we can discuss this more later in the questions if you'd like. First, because this promise of more jobs and through adding more solar or wind doesn't on its own get rid of fossil fuels. Biden's plan is to be partly funded by ending fossil fuel subsidies, so that's a good start. But evidence shows that simply adding renewable energy doesn't substitute out fossil fuels on a one-to-one -one basis. Mostly, um, historically, in the last couple hundred years, energy transitions have been more like energy additions, adding new energy sources rather than one replacing the other. So getting rid of fossil fuels, in other words, will require political struggle, not just the act of adding renewable energy. So relatedly, this promise of green jobs doesn't necessarily get to the heart of the problem of work in late capitalism. That problem includes automation, wage stagnation, the stripping of public benefits, especially in the US, but really everywhere that austerity measures are considered, the exploitation of migrant labor and global South labor, um, the exploitation of reproductive labor, which continues to be unpaid or underpaid. So there are some Green New Deal plans that try to address pieces of this problem of work, but at the end of the day, by focusing on jobs, um, there's a distraction about these more radical challenge that, challenges that we need in terms of how work is understood and valued. Finally, the third um, problem is that uh, the promise of more green jobs gets bogged down in accounting debates, like how few people are needed to actually maintain wind turbines, and or the fact that many available jobs in um, former coal communities are so-called pink collar jobs like nursing or education, where understandings of traditional masculinity come to play in terms of desire to retrain for jobs like that. Finally, it's a strategic error for the left to think that promising jobs gets to the heart of the matter in terms of why people feel attached to and support fossil fuels. In some former fossil bound regions of the US like Appalachia, which is where I live right now, or Texas, which is where I have a lot of family, fossil fuels have become potent conservative symbols rather than necessarily direct employers for many who live there. There's a small fossil fuel elite that stands to lose trillions of dollars and capitalism itself is challenged by um, the prospect of not having easy access to oil and gas. So those economic interests are real and valid and important. However, neither fossil fuels nor fossil capitalism makes much economic sense for many Americans, much less for many people living on the planet. So there's more going on here. Coal and oil do more than ensure profits. As I've been talking about energy, and most notably fossil fuels, also secure cultural meanings and political identities around bigger questions about work and meaning and value. This is why I want to emphasize that energy transition is not as simple as just switching out fuel types or adding technologies. It's about desire too. 
ending fossil fuels is also experienced by some people as a cultural or identity challenge, one that should possibly be resisted even violently. So this connects to the second energy story that I wanna point out, the first story being about jobs. The second story is also trumpeted by um, fossil fuel companies. And this is a story about energy freedom. Climate action threatens something called energy, American energy independence. This story has to do with bigger Western understandings of freedom and sovereignty. So this, this tweet is from Mike Summers, who's the president of uh, American Petroleum Institute and another Republican um, representative. But really, it's not hard to find the idea of energy independence everywhere. And especially um, in terms of the current war on Ukraine, there's been kind of a revival of it. As with the job story, this is evident across the political spectrum. So here's um, former President Obama, who gave a speech about energy in 2011. Um, and, and I highlighted this part where he says, every president since Richard Nixon has talked about freeing ourselves from dependence on foreign oil. And notice in the background of his talk, it says winning the future, American energy. So here we have the idea that losing energy is a losing America. It's important to dissect these stories because they have a powerful cultural cachet. They play upon common sense understandings of energy that infect both fossil fuels and renewable energy projects. And they need to be challenged if we're to achieve anything like a just transition. The core set of emotional relationships here are between energy, work, and freedom. And I've shown you how that nexus was born in the heart of Western science and its connections to capitalism and empire. In terms of thinking about energy politics and climate politics today, I'm also interested in how gender identities feature into this nexus of work and freedom and how hegemonic masculinities intensify the charge of these stories about fuel. So in the book, I turn to feminist critiques of work to think about a way forward in terms of how we um, transform the uh, systems of valuing work and really through um, valuing and centering care and reproductive activities. But here I, um, have done research thinking about connections to fossil fuels and how these are really uh, expressed through hegemonic masculinities. Energy desires are entangled with, in, in America, hegemonic masculine identities. And I've called this petromasculinity. And I've looked at the relationship between fossil fuel support, hypermasculinity, and authoritarianism in the US. So what I mean by hypermasculinity comes from two scholars named um, Lily Ling and Anna Agathangelou, who are feminist scholars of international relations. After September 11th, they um, identified hypermasculinity as, quote, a reactionary stance. It's when agents of hegemonic masculinity feel threatened and need to inflate or exaggerate their traditional masculinity. So in other words, petromasculinity is a, a wannabe hegemonic masculinity that feels itself to be under threat. And it's under threat from feminists, from LGBTQ movements, but also from climate change and the threat to fossil fuel cultures. Petromasculinity describes how this desire for unbounded energy consumption becomes a performance of spectacular power in a world that is seen to be increasingly threatening to that identity. The fossil fuel PR machine counts on these desires and relies upon a kind of petro nostalgia amplified by uh, messages like make America great again, which refers back to this fantasy of mid 20th century life when white men ruled their households. So here we have a tweet from Trump um, referring to the suburban lifestyle dream, which was a lot, you know, he really talks about how white women should vote for him because he's protect, protecting the suburban dream. 
The achievement of this um, 1950s patriarchal ideal was built upon a steady supply of cheap fossil fuels, cars, suburbs, highways, the nuclear family, all oriented around white male workers. And that was a social infrastructure that was yoked to a fossil fuel infrastructure that made this dream possible. So having plentiful gas and energy came to seem essential for American well-being. Extracting and burning fuel became a ritual of white masculinity and also of American sovereignty. The explosive power of combustion could be um, crudely equated with virility and also with freedom, where freedom means the ability to do what you like with your property, to burn, to produce, to expand, putting it to work to its full capacity. So the Trump administration called this a policy of, quote, energy domination. And like so many things involved with the Trump era, this wasn't really a new policy. It was more an unabashed declaration of what had been going on um, all along in terms of US imperialism. And so we see several years ago, uh, Rick Perry, who, who served as the Secretary of Energy under Trump, promoting American exports of quote, freedom gas abroad. So apparently, uh, natural or fossil gas is made from, quote, molecules of U.S. freedom. Just as American soldiers liberated Europe from the Nazis, Perry says, America once again can liberate Europe with its fossil fuels. Um, so this is fun to laugh at, less so now with the war in Ukraine, but it should be taken as a serious explanation of how fossil fuels fit into this narrative about American sovereignty. So here, soldier bodies and gas molecules are both righteous means to achieving freedom. And this is a freedom from dependency on, quote, foreigners, which has often, especially in the case of Middle Eastern oil, been a racialized idea of what foreign oil is the most threatening. So um, I want to think more about what dependency means in this story. Freedom from foreign oil means freedom conceived of as not dependent upon others who are deemed threatening. And this is based upon a white and masculinized notion of freedom. Freedom for an upright self, like this statue, who stands tall as an able-bodied adult man who needs no one and controls his domain, whether his household or his nation. Work is central to this idea of freedom because that upright self, by definition, is productively employed. And um, in the Jefferson settler colonial ideal owns land. Maybe in the 21st century, that means has a mortgage on a house. This person is not dependent and is not idle. Like its citizens, the nation state should also be independent, self-sufficient. In Western culture, we think about dependency as something fearful, as set within hierarchical power structures. Dependency means subordination, constraint. To be free is to move up a ladder towards independence. This desire or ideal of independence flies in the face of reality at multiple levels because life is deeply and unavoidably enmeshed in relations of dependency, not just between humans, even this subject of Western freedom, this self is not ontologically real. You can think of, for example, the number of non-humans who inhabit human bodies um, to the porosity of the skin and the things that are constantly passing in and out of our bodies through our food and through the air we breathe. Even from a very anthropocentric view of global energy politics, the idea that the US as a nation state is independent as a result of um, fracking is delusional, given that the US is heavily reliant on exploitative global supply chains, as well as global credit to support its massive debt. So the fantasy of independence requires that these dependencies be managed and um, ideally erased. And that includes reproductive labor, underpaid workers, the more than human world, 
Much of these activities, by the way, we learned were quote, essential during the pandemic. It's more than erasing or devaluing these kinds of work. It's also about refusing these as relationships and instead setting up extractive regimes where the labor and the energy of others are taken from their worlds and made into resources to be used. Instead, recognizing dependency is about acknowledging that these are always relations that could involve obligations, accountability, mutuality. And I think that's the route through which dependency is less scary and more um, part of life, a managed part of life. So I'm working through this um, Western fear of dependency in order to push against the idea that it's uni that the sphere of dependency is universal or somehow human nature. Um, fossil fuels and even solar panels in, in Western energy logic relieve this fear by seeming to promise easy power. The fear of dependency reflects the fragility of the Western project of freedom. It's a master's fear. Ironically, those at the top are the most dependent of all. The American way of life depends upon not having its debts come due or not having its debts seen as real debts. And th this um, kind of, Th the means by which this is managed are, are often violent and militaristic means. The desire for independence is, um, reflects this anxiety of facing the constant growth of this debt. The interest owed on this debt is the dark side of the commitment to wanting to grow. And I think too often we think about the um, commitment to economic growth as a desire for expansion, but I think it's also a running away, a way to distract from or deflect demands uh, and debts due uh, to these dependent relationships. So obviously we've strayed here quite a ways from energy, but I hope it's become clear that an energy transition needs to go much deeper than a shift in fuel technology, that it touches upon these broader ideas about freedom and work. The capacious notion of energy is tied to these problematic Western stories that are largely accepted as common sense and not critically examined when fuel is discussed. The idea that unlimited easy energy is the desire that everyone has and should, um, should pursue is something that needs to be challenged. And I wanted to end by emphasizing that this desire for endless energy also appears in many uh, renewable energy projects and isn't necessarily vanquished by uh, getting rid of fossil fuels. So here are just two egregious examples, which is the Tesla Cybertruck and the Hummer EV, which are both marketed um, as tightly connected to American hegemonic masculinities. I also wanted to play an ad uh, for you, two ads for you from Solar City, which is a company that was owned formerly by Elon Musk, who's the man in that picture in front of the uh, Cybertruck. And in these ads, I want you to really think about dependency and how um, renewable energy is now used as a way to promise an escape from dependency. So still we have the same sense of fear and desire at work. Um, this might not work actually. Okay, yes, I think, um, I think I'm gonna have a technical difficulty right now in the moment. So maybe when I come on, I can have these ads ready if there's time to watch them. But essentially in these two ads, this first ad is comparing solar power to natural gas. And in the ad, it's, it depicts gas as an energy, so a fuel source that has this long and dirty extractive supply chain. And then right at the end of the ad, it shows a truck arriving at a suburban house with, and putting solar panels on the roof um, as if 
solar panels just appear on the front lawn and the front garden without any of its own extractive supply chain, which of course we all know um, to be untrue. So this desire to kind of erase or make invisible or not account for um, solar energy too involving extraction. The second um, ad is set inside an American house with two men watching TV and in this ad, the sun god Ra is vacuuming the floor, sort of like a housewife. And the sun god Ra is meant to stand for solar power in the house doing work for the men. And there's kind of a sense that, you know, it's now no longer acceptable that we have a housewife in that role due to feminist <laughs> ideas about housework. But the sun somehow steps in as this easy kind of power that you don't have to feel that bad about. But in the depiction of this man, uh, this very orientalized depiction of the sun god, of course, while we're sort of um, not having to deal with gender anxiety, we have really heavy kind of racial tropes going on and also um, uh, kind of an unexamined uh, notions of um, global south dependency that we're somehow overcoming with solar panels. So there's a lot to unpack in these commercials, um, but they show that this masculinized dream of power forever, of a technology that can one day free us from nature finally and be clean and not be tainted by demands of miners in the global south or women in the household, um, without the discomfort of servitude. The underbelly of this fantasy is that by, if environmentalists or me calls for recognizing these dependencies, that then feels like giving up freedom. It feels like something that would be done as a sacrifice rather than along the lines of desire. So this is the most insidious problem with these two stories about energy, is that if we accept them as the framework for climate action, work and freedom, um, then environmentalists get positioned as the people asking for sacrifice and discipline and giving things up, as the people working against desire. However, my proposition is that be, by being aware of these stories as troubling constructs rather than as natural fact, we can disrupt them. That's where the importance of desire comes in. The catch is there needs to be, in order to make dependency and um, these different ideas about activity and power, in order to make this desirable, there has to be a simultaneous transformation of land, labor, and money for such a freedom to function. It's not just a matter of justice, of paying back what's owed, it's also a matter here of building new worlds in which dependency could be fulfilling rather than exhausting, as it is now for so many. A matter of taking care of those who care for us. It would be, I think, a freedom that could, we could long for rather than fear. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kara. Oh, Kara, you're with us. That's fantastic. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, thank you so much for for uh, um, taking the time and and uh, probably uh, having a very early start today uh, for this session. I would uh, ask uh, uh, now our uh, uh, auditorium. Uh, we have around uh, fifty people with us this morning. It's a, it's a busy end of the semester. Uh, to turn on your cameras and. I think we will have around uh, 20 minutes or maybe half an hour with Kara to uh, debate this uh, uh, fascinating lecture. It was, uh, it was really enjoyable and thank you for that uh, recording, <laughs> which, uh, um, you know, um, I, I really, I really appreciate that uh, that you that you made it especially for us and that you that you took the time to really uh, elaborate your argument. I mean, you took us through a kind of a incredible um, 
insights from the kind of a, a disrupting of, of, you know, the entire energy construct and the laws of thermodynamics. I enjoy that a lot. I didn't know the quote uh, about, you know, about this suspicion of the kind of laws of thermodynamics smelling differently and being uh, unblushingly economic. I wrote it down. I mean, it's really, uh, uh, let's say, fascinating. And then you, you know, you linked basically energy politics and fossil fuel production to, um, I think, the kind of logic of, of kind of subordination of, uh, let's say, reproductive, creative, communal work, uh, uh, you know, to the idea of the productive work and the kind of, a, 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 let's say, um, productivism in, in general. And you um, you then kind of took us to these narratives or stories uh, that, uh, you know, serve in the political theater to hardwire the dependence uh, on, on fossil fuels you know, jobs and energy freedom. And then we, um, um, or freedom from dependence on foreign oil, let's say. And then we 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 got into this sort of uh, uh, the desire theater with, with, with masculinities and with, you know, not only the petro masculinities, but also renewable masculinities. And so that uh, that uh, was all absolutely fascinating. So a lot to to cover. And uh, I see already. Uh, so thank you, Kara. It was really uh, uh, wonderful to to get uh, to know your work in this way. So let's uh, let's go immediately into the conversation. I see Ashoka with the raised hand. Um, uh, it would be great if you would switch on your 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 camera to to ask the question, but also fine if you if you don't feel like it. Yeah. Hi, Ashoka. Great to see you. Hi. Thank you so much for the you know lecture. I really enjoyed it. So I am a doctoral student uh, in energy history and I am on the History of Anthropocene Chair at the University of Zurich. So most of the readings that I'm doing now are directly related to some of the concepts that we study. But, you know, again, the approach is from history. So two of my questions are based on that. Um, the relationship between energy and work, at least in the lecture, seems to emerge from an internal discourse of, you know, history of science. Basically, scientists discuss like concepts and like you know, it's kind of like an internal discourse. But um, when I this when I think about books like Owen Barak's Powering Empire, you know, like he speaks about steamboats, their interaction with scientists, coal production, create ideas of like a different kind of work, which I think is not an internal discourse, of but it can way. So, would you think? Ah, sorry, I was muted. So, uh, so uh, uh, we can we will wait for for a shock to get a more stable connection. Please uh, let us know if if other comments or observations are are there. I uh, see um, a couple of people in the auditorium who who work uh, uh, on on very related themes to what Kara presented. I can start with um, uh, with. Uh, uh, let's see, with the with the question that I have. Uh, so, you know, there. Um, I mean, we let's see the notion of of big oil. <laughs> you know, uh, um, 
we uh, are, um, I think, uh, uh, clear about the fact that the the the, the fossil fuel, uh, you know, production and distribution is um, linked or based on, uh, um, let's say, a handful of major corporations, uh, which are uh, multinational entities that uh, are very much, um, um, I would say, you know, that are linked to the states, but also to some extent above the law. I mean, we are we are aware of, uh, of the lobbies and so on. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the 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 question is why, why, or or you know. I, I'm I was I was curious why why you didn't uh you know involve that thread, let's say, into you know, into the story. Because I think we could talk about a certain uh let's say de democratization in terms of you know energy, let's say production and availability. You know, I think that that is that is one of the themes that is somehow very clearly. You know this somehow also this uh, um, uh, a creation of this sort of let's say masculine desires, uh, you know, and and as you as you explained, the kind of promotion of such images is obviously uh, uh, very much linked to to this sort of a very uh, very very uh, um, um, centralized uh, let's say mindset of of energy production that is that is sort of. Uh, uh you know let's say in the in the hands of uh, of a very large player so how uh, i'm i'm just curious to to get a, 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 a maybe a thread of conversation around that uh thank you and it's nice to talk with you all um no for sure the the role of big oil corporations fossil fuel influence on um power is enormous and significant. Um, the interest of the work on petromasculinity is not a, a story, it's not about instead of understanding the importance of big oil's power, but rather supplementing our understanding of why there is a public attachment to oil and going beyond um, an argument that's either only about big oil as the as the main villain and if we got rid of that everything would proceed which um arguably i mean that might be the case <laughs> but mm -hmm. i think in the us in particular what i'm interested in um is uh research into especially um former coal field communities um many of which are around where i live now in appalachia or um for example, in Texas, which has become a big wind power state, that there has been cultivated in especially rural publics in the US, this broader um, culture uh, in which fossil fuels, not only as a source of power, but also as a code for a certain kind of work, um, remain really important and what happens, you know, for example, in the coal field communities where I am is this is this um, is, is cultivated by bit the big oil companies or big coal mm -hmm. companies. Um, precisely in the moment when coal jobs are on the decrease on the decline for lots of reasons, um, there's a, a very conscious push to reattach um the public to coal and a lot of times this is moving attachments from unions where um they used to mostly reside onto coal itself so coal becomes this object of desire it's really separate from um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. necessarily its role at providing jobs for the community um so so I, I'm trying to understand this um, this story as as both these big companies, but also this broader culture that um, needs to be appreciated when we want to think about 
what is hampering political action and transition, especially in energy intensive uh, regions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Ashoka was able to come back, but I, I think I kind of <laughs> understood a bit of the first question. I, I hesitate to respond without hearing the full thing, but um, I think I it's a question. Is yeah, he here? He, he is here. I can see his name on one of the. I, okay. Is it is it better now? <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I think my first question was about the concept of work and energy because uh, the the works that I'm used to reading, especially if they're talking about 19th century uh, emergence of concepts of energy and work, they seem to be rooted in a discourse that's not internal to science and to me, it seems that a lot of European common sense about energy and work seem to be more linked to that, you know, about how labor structures, for example, relate to, you know, steamboats and coal mining. And, you know, I feel like I would rather situate it there. So I wonder if you would differentiate the notion of work within the internal science debate and as it relates to labor structures outside science or in relation to science. Um, and the second question is, uh, would you, uh, where would you situate the notion of freedom, particularly when you're talking about work, energy, and freedom within the science debates? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I think this reveals the, um, the risks when, uh, when I'm trying, I'm giving this talk where I was trying to combine some of the book with some of my more recent work. And what that, what happened is I basically left out the bulk of what's happening in the book. So in the book, I'm, I start in this moment of science and, and you're really right to point out that that in and of itself is missing political and historical context. So much of the book is starting with this science, but then really interested in why it becomes politicized. And for me, why it becomes politicized is precisely what you say, that this is entering into um, uh, an imperial project. And in particular, at a moment when imperialism is shifting from, towards um, a really information heavy uh, project that's trying to gather all this data and then is really interested in using these new scientific fields to quote unquote make sense of it. But also it's a project that W.E.B. Du Bois said the problem of empire, the, the problem is labor at this moment. The problem is in particular transforming ways of life in which um, there is a resistance to this kind of imperial labor being extracted uh, and doing so at the same time that you have huge moments of labor resistance um, in Europe and increasingly at the turn of the 20th century in the US as well. So energy is absolutely entering into this context. And I think that's why it becomes connected to work because there's a problem of work that's happening. And so the book is really interested in that wider context. So I really appreciate your question for allowing me to <laughs> expand and elaborate on that because you're right. It is not just internal to science. And the reason that, I, um, that I'm interested in going back to the science is because for me, what the power of this narrative has is the seeming rootedness in this kind of objectivity and in the king of sciences, physics. So I wanted to start with the science to start from the very beginning with provincializing this kind of knowledge and saying from the beginning, not that it's true or false, but that it has this context, it has a set of interests um, in terms of the way that it, that it is interpreted from the start. Um, to open up that we can have different ways of understanding, valuing, counting, tracking energy that aren't necessarily unscientific, but there's, there are different knowledges and different approaches to energy. And then your second question was um, about, so you're asking how, how does freedom appear in science, in the sciences? Is that the question? Uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, referring to the first part of the you know talk about uh, because I think you spoke about thermodynamics and relationship between energy and work, and then later on you also brought in freedom. So I wonder if you're, yeah, I, I wonder like was there like uh, were you referring to something else or was it the same kind of freedom in relation to I don't know work and waste or like you know labor efficiency or something like that because this seems I don't know I think I just was hoping for some sort of an elaboration on the concept of freedom here yeah. um yeah no that's 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 a really interesting question um how how does freedom appear or how is it understood in these earlier scientific cultures um i think in part i honestly i think i'd have to think more about this because when i'm when i'm thinking about freedom later in the talk i'm really um now rooted in a contemporary culture uh and i'm thinking a lot about freedom through especially critiques of american notions of freedom coming out of um black feminist thought or i mean these are this is a very different context but i think it's a it's a great question my first um response would be that these new sciences of energy were um the other thing I didn't get to talk about as much is they were they were had a very theological dimension to them. Um, and they were interpreted at, at, as um, a sign that the earth was kind of this fallen place where, in particular, because energy is always running down. And um, so this notion of kind of having to put the world to work as a project. I think in this sense, um, energy is kind of a, a both the sign of unfreedom, but also the means through which this kind of freedom can be achieved. And I wouldn't know, I wouldn't say necessarily it means freedom in the same way. It's more like the way grace or the sacred could be achieved. I have to think more about it. That's a great question. Thanks overall for the talk. I really came across new ideas. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Kara. I uh, I wonder uh, um, we are uh, we are uh, still uh, open uh, for for questions for another couple of minutes. Uh, Luke, great, <laughs> great to hear you. Uh, great to see oh. you. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Elise Nelson, for organizing this and care for the talk. Um, also, really appreciated it. And I was really kind of drawn to your um, description of kind of the reproductive, uh, I want to say maybe activity instead of work, reproductive activity, uh, and the kind of division between productive labor that you drew. Um, I think both the kind of in the capitalist mainstream and then also even in its of standard Marxist critique. Um, and I was struck especially to see that uh, kind of in dialogue with this thermodynamics model where you have the work and the waste um, and kind of maybe not neatly mapping those two things onto it, but at least kind of drawing a, a parallel. Uh, and so I was just kind of curious to hear, uh, maybe you expand on that, um, especially with the idea kind of that this critique um, from kind of Marxist feminism around the um uh, idea of reproductive labor and kind of wages for housework um how that maybe opens up um new ground in terms of these uh potential um energy uh comments that, that you were discussing thank you luke um so the in the conclusion of the book i turn to feminist um anti-work movements and in particular i use the work of kathy weeks which based on your question i think you're probably familiar with um she has a book called the problem with work and um what i try to do in her book she doesn't talk at all about environmental issues or problems which is fine because the book is doing a lot already um but i want 
I wanted to try to make the case that these critiques of work can and should be in alliance with climate movements um, and have quite a lot to say to each other. And so I sort of speculate about in, in Weeks's book, she calls for two uh, utopian demands, one of which is a basic living income and one is a shorter work week. And she, there's a lot of framing around these demands for her because she doesn't want these to be seen as some sort of magical single answer, but rather like the wages for housework movement, it's in the act of making these demands that new communities form, new subjectivities form, new narratives emerge. Um, and so I, I have some speculation at the end of the book about if we have these strong narratives around the goodness of work and productivity and so on. Um, and also really our, a lot of our basic needs and pleasures are met through that system. So it's not surprising at all that there's a public kind of devotion to this, that ideas like um, challenging hours of work or providing more basic goods and basic income could be a way to a leverage that opens up space and allows for new ways of thinking about energy and really cuts off the fossil fuel argument um, at its heart because there, there is not that I can see another narrative, like really the jobs narrative is so crucial. Um, not just for fossil fuels, but even now petrochemical industries that are trying to build plants. For example, in the US, they come into these communities that have already experienced a lot of toxic injustice. But the argument is this, you're a poor community, you need jobs. We're gonna give you jobs. So I'm trying to think about politically, strategically, tactically, how can we provide these things that communities really need outside of, you know, and really sort of, um, minimize the power of this bad bargain thank you yeah this is this is uh, this is very clear uh cara it's very interesting and so this uh, this kind of a vision of of this let's say post productivist <laughs> relations <laughs> um let's 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 imagine that that we can you know we are also here let's say a lot of us here are architects and you know i think people think about how to uh let's see how to approach um um you know, I would say, let's say, special assemblages, you know, that, that you know, support everyday life uh, in that sense. So, so uh, what else can we do to, um, to empower these communities, you know, let's say on the, on that, <laughs> on that list, which includes basic income and the shorter work week, what, what else can we put? Because let's say I I I am I am uh, I, I think we are we are having similar conversations and exploring exploring those notions. It is clear that a kind of a non-productivist uh, mindset would you know in its in its very um, you know core uh, you know be be. Uh, less consumption based you know it would you know the values would shift in a in a in a, in a different uh uh in different places the the question the questions that open up would be you know how how do we ultimately produce energy how do we uh you know how do we um organize where does the governance rest uh, how do we relate to the land you know what what do we do with with time, you know, let's not call it free, <laughs> you know, and so on. So let's see these. Uh, these, uh, uh, I think, I think there is a, there is a um, uh, sense that, or at least, you know, we 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 see this kind of. Uh, um, uh, I would say the the. Um, um, uh, you know, as I see the kind of politics on the left is is sort of being re reassembled and from from uh, you know in in we, we have very very exciting and and dynamic conversations right now 
um, on on different levels. No, so I I perhaps just want to ask you to to share with us some more speculations or maybe more of exciting uh, uh, references or or conversations that you're part of in uh, along these lines. Maybe just a quick addition because it's it's uh, in line with Milica's question. Uh, in the beginning, you started with this Haraway's uh, quote, which uh, you said, I mean, this idea for the biological cell, this real uh, material entity, and then this all these uh, cultural and metaphorical uh, connotations that it has. So I, uh, I guess that uh, you are kind of in a way suggesting for this shift that we are supposed to go through we need that uh, for the energy to change like these connections uh, connotations also this work power energy triangle and how it connects with freedom uh, so my question uh, addition to Melissa's question would be uh, how how uh, I mean where do you see how, how to change this uh, cultural mindset and uh, these metaphors and so that it leads to not this energy addition which you said but actually a transition and kind of a, a just and a livable future for for our planet and uh, everyone involved in it yeah um okay well those are those are big questions and I'm yes. glad that there are so many of us here working on them together because my first um, answer would be that um, there cannot be one answer there has there's going to be lots of experiments lots of answers and also there are different contexts so a lot of my what I was talking about today was about what you were saying um, Nasli about um changing a mindset in a very uh, consumerist, energy intensive, but also highly unequal culture, which is the US and maybe more familiar to Europe. But really it's a global issue. And, uh, and when we think about energy and climate justice, um, I think the changing of a mindset um, especially among more high intensive energy communities is about um, a mindset towards uh, equality as something that could be more equality as something that could be desirable and more, um, you know, a lot of people need more energy and housing and um and so, you know, on the one hand, in the global north, there's discussion of of kind of ratcheting down, but that can be really out of sync with a lot of needs for more in other places, even within the global north. And so, to me, that this is why, in some ways, thinking about energy brings me away from energy because it really always comes back to questions of social justice and just trying to make the case for energy and climate justice, not as some kind of icing on the cake, like the right thing to do, the nice thing to do, but as actually necessary to sustainability. And um, there was a recent article in Nature about um, energy that I think it was very data heavy and there's some of it that I might take issue with, but uh, the article was about energy consumption and it, it basically showed if we were to provide everyone on earth, assuming kind of population increase by 2050 with what they called a, a dignified life, enough energy and resources for a dignified life, the total amount of energy would be 40% of what is being consumed right now. And there's a lot of intricacies to this article, but essentially the, the point was the real problem is the extreme inequality happening and the, the extremely high consumption happening in some relatively small corridors. 
And so what I'm interested in as, as a political theorist is, okay, well, how do you change that? Because to me, the problem is that there is this broader cultural support for something that's benefiting a, a smaller number of people with these kind of like the sort of small marginal benefits trickling out perhaps. Um, in terms of practical things for architects, back to the, the first question, I'm really, I've been really um, thinking a lot with people working on infrastructure as, as important mm -hmm. to this, because um, when you live in these extractive and energy intensive cultures, there just simply isn't social, not not just infrastructure as roads or bike lanes, which are bike lanes, public transit, but also social infrastructures. There really isn't a system, a material system in which those things could be pleasurable. Like my bike ride to work is really scary because I don't have a bike path the whole way, simple things like that. Or I live in a co-housing community and the houses were designed really small on small lots around a central green pedestrian only. And that design radically changes the way the community feels mm -hmm. and how people engage with each other. Um, so I think those are things that are very familiar to you as architects, but mm -hmm. I think for me politically, um, if we want to think about desire, infrastructure is really important to um, supporting those kinds of alternative pleasures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I hope uh, they will not be alternative, but, you know, like uh, equitable and, and available and we can somehow make it make it happen or, or let's say tur turn turn the mindset into 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 that direction. I, I fully agree. It does uh, ultimately come come down to the question of 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 justice and uh, and the different kind of uh, equity and you know how um how can we let's say approach that that vision from from different sides um we i uh, i have to uh tell you we we have to wrap up unfortunately uh, because of uh, you know students are are committed and have to participate in other other courses uh, there are uh, a, a few uh, projects and initiatives that that are, uh, I, I I think, really really resonant, and you know there would be possibly a, a kind of exciting exchange in the future. So we will we will keep you posted. Uh, and I I have been thinking during your talk about the kind of possible uh, linkages at the ETH. So we'll. We'll keep you posted. Uh, in uh, our studio, we've been working on, um, uh, let's say, a, a just, uh, let's call it a just energy transition in um, um, as a kind of a, a research and a design project in the uh, area in Germany uh, called the Rhineland, where uh, the largest um, uh, German Energy Corporation, which is now also multi multinational RVA, uh, 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 you know, is in fact in charge still of uh, coal mining uh, at a massive scale, but also uh, holds a very, very major role in a renewable energy transition in that in that region and for the country as a whole. So the kind of entanglement, let's say, of these, uh, 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 you know, uh, I would say the, the flows of, of this multinational capital, you know, with the actual territory, with the different levels of government, and then ultimately, you know, how it all reflects in the uh, in everyday life and in the kind of ecology of that area is really fascinating. So. We'll just, uh, um, uh, I, I know that it's very late to, to invite you for such an event because it's on, uh, I think, on the on the 20, 20th, 21st of December. But we'll just test our luck and maybe we'll, we'll, you know, record the whole thing for you or share the results afterwards so that, uh, that we keep in touch. So uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I hope we will get a chance in the future to, to you know, um, uh, 
maybe uh, work work together on a, on a kind of uh, um, uh, politics of energy from design perspective, <laughs> and uh, to to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Kara. It was really such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for your work, which is really uh, inspiring for us. Oh, thank you. It was nice to talk to you all. <laughs> Please Thanks do invite so much, me. Kara. I'll see if I can uh, if I can join future things. Super. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye. All the best. Ciao. Kara, if you like Good luck. It, she went. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good luck. I wanted everyone. to ask these links. Um, everyone is going, but I will send the third grade exercise today. So if yeah. anyone is curious about that. Of course, yeah, great. So uh, one more session to go. Good luck, everyone, uh, in the finish of the semester. And uh, be well and healthy. And until next week, cheers. <laughs>